Thank you for joining the Judaism Demystified podcast. Professor Goodman, first of all, you're one of the most requested uh, guest returnees. So we're just so happy that we're able to, to do this again. We've been in touch a lot, obviously, uh, over the year since I think it was a year or so since you were on last. And uh, we're really looking forward to this because for everybody listening, uh, we wanted to discuss the new translation uh, to the guide, which you which you just made. And um, it's been previously done by Moshe Friedlandler and most notably Shlomo Pinas. Uh, what has driven you to write this new translation to the guide? And what do you hope to add or change from the previous translations? Thank you. Uh, and I should say, when, once we get started, it's really a pleasure to be back. And I love uh, being here. And uh, it's a... Uh, uh, it's a wonderful program, and I've heard nice feedback about uh, what you posted. Uh, the uh, the Freelander translation was the first into English. Uh, you could see, uh, I, I used to teach it years ago. It was uh, reprinted very inexpensively by Dover, and uh, uh, my students could afford, uh, if you would believe, uh, a big fat paperback like that cost $1.40. Uh, back in the day, and uh, it because it was the first, it has many mistakes in it. Friedlander was feeling his way. Uh, he was he was a scholarly man. You could see when you when you when you used his translation that uh, when he was in trouble with the Arabic, he would uh, rely on uh, Ibn Tibbon's uh, uh, important Hebrew translation, uh, which is very natural for him, and that's something that a lot of uh, traditional people uh, had access to when we're reading themselves. Uh, and naturally, uh, in that pioneering position that Friedlander was in, he, um, uh, he, he has mistakes in his translation. Uh, uh, there was one way in which his translation was extremely useful to me, uh, but the Dover people did not include his notes. His notes are very extensive and relied upon uh, the four traditional commentaries from the Middle Ages uh, on the Guide to the Perplexed. And uh, those are very valuable, uh, walking you through what uh, others thought about it. Uh, but uh, in order to make the book uh, cheap and uh, accessible and so forth, uh, they stripped that all out. So uh, you can still get the... Uh, uh, if you if you know how to work the internet, you know you can you can get the uh, the full Freelander. Originally, it was in three volumes, and uh, there was a one volume edition which contained all of the uh, uh, notes that he had done. Uh, and you'll see them cited whenever we used anybody. Uh, Phil Lieberman and I, my my coworker on that uh, new translation of the guide, uh, whenever we cited anybody. Uh, we always gave credit, and we uh, often found ourselves giving credit to Friedlanders pointing out uh, things that the traditional commentators had used. The other translation, and by the way, uh, one nice thing about Friedlander, he wrote in a kind of Victorian English, which was still uh, accessible to people at the time when he was doing that work in the 19th century, uh, and uh, it fits in a way. Uh, with the kind of uh, traditional uh, phraseology that people find in the Guide to the Perplexed. Uh, in the case of um, Shlomo Penis' translation, Shlomo Penis, and that really is how his name was pronounced, he kind of insisted on it even when he was teaching. Uh, I, knew, I knew him, he was a great Arabist, and a great scholar, uh, a, a very warm and lovely man. Uh, he was asked to do this because of the interest in the guide of Leo Strauss. And uh, uh, there was a scholar at the University of Chicago, uh, Ralph Lerner, who was, uh, who was still around. Uh, and uh, he was supposed to help uh, Shlomo Penis uh, with his English because uh, he was not a native speaker of English. He knew many languages, but uh, uh, Lerner was also keeping an eye on uh, Penis's translation to make sure it stayed consistent with Leo Strauss's interpretation. And uh, readers who are interested in my uh, forthcoming 
companion volume to the new translation, which is called the Guide to the Guide, of course, uh, is uh, uh, they will they will find that uh, uh, Shlomo Penis had his own idea of uh, what the guide was all about. Uh, he originally began work on that in Germany in the 1930s. And you can understand the pressure that someone would feel in that time period. And uh, everyone who worked on anything at all Jewish at that time, eventually that was all suppressed. But uh, Leo Strauss uh, uh, was very concerned with the uh, political overtones of a work and uh, developed the idea that medieval philosophers were not necessarily telling it the way they really saw it, that they were concealing their true intentions, and he set about trying to uh, work that out. It was a reflection of the oppressive times that uh, uh, Leo Strauss lived under uh, and eventually got out from under uh, when he came to this country, when he when he got out from under the thumb of people who were being at first watched and eventually destroyed by the Nazis. Uh, and uh, his thesis uh, about that indirection in the in the guide uh, lived long after him. Uh, Leo Strauss uh, followed the Talmudic dictum of uh, raising up many disciples. And he had many disciples and uh, he was a man with an idea. Uh, many of his disciples uh, attached themselves to that idea and were not themselves as creative and original in their thinking as he was. Uh, the, uh, the thesis that the guide is really uh, concealing its true message and uh, is adopting a, um, a skeptical view about uh, uh, biblical and rabbinic uh, outlook uh, was attractive to many people, uh, partly because it, it seemed contrarian and partly because uh, it was something new. Uh, it was new in 1935 when uh, Strauss first brought it up, but he, but he brought it up again in the 40s and again in the 50s and it became uh, a whole school of thought. Uh, many of the avatars of that school of thought were, were not uh, as, as learned or as creative as Leo Strauss himself was. But Penis was supposed to translate the guide in that same spirit. And partly as a result, uh, he, uh, he projected Straussian ideas onto the text, which really don't belong there. I can be specific about that, and in the commentary and in the guide to the guide, I, I go into some detail about that. Uh, uh, we have to believe that the Rambam uh, devoted himself to halakha, to Torah, to uh, uh, the issues of how do you make biblical philosophy. Uh, we have to believe that he was very sincere about that. I think that's demonstrated on every page of the guide. And unfortunately, you miss a lot of that in uh, the penis translation. There's another problem with, two problems really with the penis translation. And I taught it for many years. And I, I know that translation very, very intimately. Um, one, I mentioned that Penis was not a native speaker of English, so he doesn't have the feel for the diction of the original. He knows Arabic. He knew Arabic very, very well. He's a great scholar of Arabic thought and literature, uh, but he didn't have the feel of the, the tone that Maimonides adopted, and that's partly because of convention that people have in translating works from Arabic, and you'll see the same thing in translations from the Hebrew. They try to be very literal. I think that uh, uh, Penis was instructed by Strauss to be very literal, but in trying to be very literal, they get very etymological. And etymology is not going to give you the real meaning of a term. You have to know the difference between a hospice and a hospital. Uh, <laughs> if you uh, uh, Usage is what determines the meaning. And uh, 
we have a letter from uh, Rambam himself uh, to Ibn Tibbon, trying to encourage Ibn Tibbon not to be so literal when he translated the guy from the Arabic into Hebrew uh, during Maimonides' own lifetime. And he said, look, uh, sometimes you'll need two words to express one idea. Sometimes you'll need one word to express two ideas. Uh, uh, don't try and follow the syntax of the original. Uh, unfortunately, Maimonides died soon after writing that letter, and the translation that we have from Ibn Tibbon tends to be a little too literal. Uh, and uh, that's compounded by a convention that they have in translating Arabic and Hebrew. Um, I don't know uh, if our listeners have um, ever taken a course in Latin. When you take a course in Latin, the, the kiddies, let's say they're in eighth or ninth grade, are worried that the instructor is going to come around and see that. Uh, have they parsed this sentence correctly? Have they understood it? So they tried to imitate the idiom and the syntax of the original to show that they were parsing the sentence correctly. Uh, that's that's a good thing for a kid to do who's in middle school. It's not a good thing to do uh, if you want to make a translation have the kind of impact that the original had on the original reader. The language that the Rambam uses in the Guide to the Perplexed is conversational. Professor Lieberman and I developed the idea that it probably was dictated. He was elderly at the time when he when he wrote that book. He probably did not uh, uh, sit and, and write it out as he did other books of his. Uh, he probably was dictating, and you can see uh, that conversational, informal tone, uh, addressing the reader uh, who is a former disciple who has gone elsewhere and needs to be sent chapters. Every every little group of chapters gets sent on to him uh, through through post, which of course not not was uh, was not the the kind of mail we have today. Um, the uh, that that need to establish a rapport with your reader to build a bond of uh, intimacy and trust with your reader, to speak in a conversational tone. Uh, that all comes through in the guide. It is not written in a formalistic sort of way. It's written in, in an intimate, engaging way in the manner of a uh, risala, as it's called in Arabic, a, a, an essay in the form of a letter. The whole thing opens with a letter and it tells what the occasion is for writing the letter. And uh, sometimes in an essay, you'll see um, uh, an author addressing his uh, uh, reader and trying to bring him on board, trying to explain what, what we're up to, what we're trying to achieve together. Uh, Rambam does that all the time, right through, right through the book, uh, speaking to him in a in a warm and friendly and even fatherly way. The essay form originates in antiquity in the form of letters where that the, the highly structured uh, organization that you see in the Rambam's legal code, the Mishnah Torah, is not found in the guide. On the contrary, it's very digressive, it's very informal, it's organization, and that serves another purpose because as uh, as Strauss suspected, uh, there is a subtext in the guide. Uh, it's not, don't believe anything I'm telling you, uh, that's, that's a little extreme, but, uh, but the subtext is one uh, of trying to make sure that a reader who is not prepared to um, deal with serious philosophical problems does not get in over his or her head. Uh, and the way that's done is that the Rambam in the guide does not name the problems he's going to address. Even the problem of evil, which is a well-known philosophical problem, he doesn't name it. He says, well, I'll tell you about the Book of Job. Uh, if you've thought at all about the Book of Job, you know that you're going to be dealing with the problem of evil. Why do innocents suffer? Why do wicked people apparently prospered. Uh, but uh, but the Rambam introduces all his problems obliquely, indirectly, 
and counts on the reader to understand what the problem is. That will deal with questions that are critical in the guide, like what is the nature of revelation? What is a prophet really? How does how does rabbinic language relate to biblical language? Uh, different kind of approach, different idiom. Uh, and uh, by using that indirect method, I'm not laying out his you know introduction and telling you here are the problems we're going to address and so forth. Uh, using the essay form, he can he can make sure that people who are not really motivated or capable of dealing with those problems and seeing their way through how to deal with them uh, are not in danger by trying to uh, address issues that they don't know how to address. So, uh, so that's a uh, that, that that's that there is an esoteric text. But the esoteric text is not occult, is not hermetic. It's uh, it's a um, it's a way of bringing along those who are exercised by those problems and leaving behind those who are bored by those problems or aren't competent to address them or don't have the courage to address them uh, and so forth. Uh, that's a that's a that's a, a a nuance which the old translations tend to miss. That is uh makes me feel like I want to start reading it like right now. <laughs> that was really good. Um, and I wanted to get into the idea or the problem of contradictions. How yes. do you deal? How do you deal with the contradictions in the mora? What is your um in the guide? What is your approach to dealing with contradictions in the guide? Good question. Uh. Followers of Leo Strauss uh, made a big point out of contradictions because Strauss took, uh, Maimonides had a little discussion where he lists seven different kinds of contradictions that a work might have uh, or a body of literature might contain. And uh, Strauss uh, thought that contradictions were the, the breadcrumbs in the path that would lead you to seeing what the Rambam's true intentions were. Uh, that he embedded contradictions in the text. So when he says he believes this, or you should uh, understand that, uh, he doesn't really mean it. But the but the little contradictions are the hint that uh, uh, he, he's he means the opposite of what he's saying. Uh, that is a false issue. There are contradictions in every text. I've not yet come across any serious thinker who avoids all contradictions. Even the great philosophers, Aristotle, Spinoza, nobody's more systematic than Spinoza, uh, but no philosopher has solved all the problems. Uh, if they did, philosophy would be over and finished, but it's not because there are always ways of uh, finding another angle, objecting to a certain, here's a problem you haven't solved yet, the Rambam's most concerned with apparent contradictions in the Torah itself. The fact that he admits that there might be contradictions in his own book uh, is uh, taken and jumped on by Straussians because they think that, oh, that's going to take us to the fact that he doesn't really believe in what he's saying. That's a mistake. It's a serious mistake. And if you read the guide to the guide, you'll see how badly that uh, idea was handled. The kind of contradictions that the Rambam is concerned with, for example, are pedagogical contradictions where a uh, where the Rambam uh, uh, needs to introduce an idea in an oversimplified sort of way. Uh, later on, as you read on, he expects you to read patiently, he expects you to read the guide more than once. You'll see that the contradictions are only apparent. Uh, but the Torah, the Torah, the, the kind of contradictions the Torah contains, we know that God is not a physical being. But the Torah always talks about God as God, as though God were a physical being. That's a contradiction. And uh, in the course of the guide, he will explain to you why the Torah talks about God as though he were a physical, a physical being and uh, how to understand what it means. That means that you have to understand 
the poetics of the of the of the Torah. The Torah is written in uh, in a lot of metaphors because a God is so transcendent. We can't describe God directly. You can see that in the eloquent silence of Bereshit, the book of Genesis. Um, it doesn't try to tell you uh, why God created the world. It just starts out by saying that God created the world. Uh, uh, you're going to have to try and understand what that means and what what depth that idea has. And the Rambam always has rabbinic company. Uh, and the rabbis said that the act of creation is, is so profound that... Uh, it really is 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 quite beyond us to understand how that was done, uh, and so uh, uh, the Torah just tells you boldly. Um, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Uh, uh, that's our starting point, uh, and and we're going to uh, we're going to work with that idea, uh, and that idea of creation is very important to the Rambam, uh, but uh, he. He does not think. He does not think that the Torah does contain contradictions. He finds certain contradictions in the rabbinic texts, and often he says that's because they say, uh, "Oh, this rabbi said this, and that rabbi said that," and they had a disagreement. So there are contradictions between them, and they have to be resolved. And sometimes the rabbis will take it as a starting point in their exegesis. That that they will say uh, 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 there's one where where uh, where they say uh, uh, Solomon, why do you contradict your father? Meaning David, <laughs> it's bad enough that you do that, and now you're contradicting yourself. Uh, so they find they find two passages that seem to disagree with each other, and um, and that becomes. A basis for exegesis. They should say, "What are they really getting at?" So they treat the rabbis treat uh, apparent contradictions in the Torah in exactly the same way that they treat the apparent contradictions between two great teachers who have to be reconciled with one another. It's a it's 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 food for thought. So, it's not hints. It's not hints of disingenuous writing. Right. So. What you're describing, what I'm trying to put together is you're describing the contradictions which the Rambam is coming to solve within the corpus of Judaism itself. But what about the contradictions within the text itself? You, If you read the translation every time one of them uh, appears, I tried to spell out what he's up to, and he will he will answer the questions uh, uh, that's where the idea of pedagogical uh, contradictions, which is one of the possibilities he mentions in explaining. Um, sometimes sometimes uh, uh, an author uh, gets a little ahead of himself or starts assuming things that he hasn't prepared the ground for. And you have to allow um, uh, oversimplification. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that he admits uh, he he may have done. He does not admit that he's embedded contradictions in the text in order to put you wise to the fact that he didn't mean what he said. Uh -huh. So the contradictions are trying to lead you to delve deeper within the matter. Sure, sure, yeah. And uh, uh, it, it would it would take some time, but if you but if you read the guide uh, with the commentary that uh, Professor Lieberman and I wrote. Uh, uh, we we pointed out well uh, uh, here here he uh, here he's using an assumption that he rejected elsewhere and uh, I'll give you the, the the most famous example uh, Maimonides upholds the creation of the world. He thinks, he says very explicitly that he believes that the world was created from nothing by God. Uh, that view was considered to be uh, impossible by people in the Aristotelian philosophical tradition, which is a tradition that he respects greatly. And those, uh, 
philosophers like Al-Farabi and Abbasetta, great Muslim philosophers uh, that we study, that I teach, um, they thought that that was incoherent to say that the world was created. Uh, he doesn't think it was inc incoherent. He doesn't think that Aristotle successfully disproved the impossibility and they successfully disproved the possibility of creation. Uh, but but he works in a very ironic manner. He wants to make peace between the eternalists and the creationists. And he follows the Muslim philosopher Ibn Tufail, who thinks that either way you get to the existence of God. Uh, you can be a creationist, and then you need God, otherwise there would be no world. Or you could be an eternalist, and in that case, uh, uh, eternal motion requires an eternal mover, and it's got to be non-physical if it's going to move things eternally. That's the argument that he uses. And uh, so you get to God either way. Now, uh, Ramba believes that not only was the world created, but he believes that that's a better argument, that he doesn't think it can be proved, but he thinks he thinks that uh, it gives you, uh, it, he thinks it's more likely, partly because he doesn't believe that everything that can not exist does exist. So there's a rule for God's will and God's exercise of that will in the creation of the world. And he thinks that retaining God's will gives you a better idea of God, not just making God into a mechanism or an algorithm of some kind that produced a world by a kind of automatism. So he's very well motivated. He acknowledges that he can't prove the world was created, but he makes a big point of saying that it couldn't be proved that it was eternal either. And he even says, which is kind of fun, that Aristotle, who makes a strong case uh, for the eternity of the world, he says he knew very well that he wasn't able to prove it. His followers thought that he proved it. But if you read it, he uses persuasive language. Aristotle uses persuasive language. He says, surely you must believe and and Rambam says uh, he wouldn't need to use persuasive language if he had a proof. This is an acknowledgement that he didn't have a proof. So so uh, uh, it's it's uh, he says he says with great respect for Aristotle, and he has great respect for Aristotle. He says he says that um, it was Aristotle who taught us the difference between proof and persuasion. That's where we learn in in Aristotle's logic. Which was the first thing Aristotle's, uh, the first thing Rambam studied in, in philosophy was his early, early book that he wrote when he was just a kid uh, in his early 20s, probably even earlier, maybe. Uh, he studied Aristotelian logic as developed by Al Farabi, the Muslim philosopher. Uh, but his dialectical argument that the world was created, his persuasion that the world was created, his argument that uh, things uh, exist uh, which don't, or thing, things, not everything that exists has to exist, which is a big argument in favor of a voluntary God who creates the world by an act of grace. He thinks he's got a better case there. But he doesn't reject, he doesn't retract his idea that the philosophers have a good case, meaning the Aristotelians who think the world is eternal. They have a good case. We have a good case. If they proved that we would have to allegorize the idea of creation, he acknowledges that. But, but his, his concession that the Aristotelian and Neoplatonic argument works for an eternal world is intention. Tension is a philosopher's polite word for contradiction. Uh, it's in tension with his own belief that the world was created. If he were a dogmatic sort of thinker, he would say they were wrong and they should be dragged out and taken to the stake. Uh, he doesn't think that. He thinks he thinks that we have a better view. Uh, he's more tolerant than that. Uh, so we see that tension there between his use of the philosopher's eternalist argument is one possibility, and our own creationist argument is another possibility. And if they proved that creation was impossible, we would have to give it up and allegorize it the same way we allegorize God's not having a human form. But uh, but that's a that that's a that's a a, a serious tension 
in the Rambam's own philosophical writing. And uh, we can allow it. We can, we can see what he's trying to do. He does not really subscribe to the idea that the, uh, that the world uh, could have been eternal. Uh, he doesn't think they have good enough reason for that. But they don't have proof and we don't have proof. So um, we won't try to make a proof where we don't have one. That's intellectual honesty. So some people might read the guide and they'll see his um, allowing of of the, the entertaining of of uh, Aristotle and Plato's or whatever his views, and they might think that oh, since he's not like you know definitively you know xing them off, he might have actually maybe even believed it. That's where someone would that, that you know, certainly are making that, the mistake. But this is not what that, that certainly has been done. That, that has, certainly has been done. But people, oh well, maybe he believed it because he leaves room for it. He leaves room uh, for I, it. Yeah, but but people who do that don't go on to pay attention to the fact that he decisively uh, uh, unmans the the Aristotelian view. He shows that it's not a proof. It's not a proof. It's a it's a it's a thing that they felt they had good reason to believe. Uh, and he's right about that, by the way. Uh, uh, they didn't they didn't have logical proof of the eternity of the world. They uh, Aristotle actually thought he did. He 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 didn't. Uh, he wasn't he wasn't just um, uh, uh, trying to be persuasive and ignoring logic. Uh, Aristotle comes from a background where the very idea of creation is considered to be incoherent because you're getting something from nothing. But of course, Rambab doesn't think it's really coming from nothing. He thinks it's coming from God. Yeah, I think one of the things that people uh, also like to say is that he was an Aristotelian um, through and through. And and I don't see that as the case. Um, I think he was very loyal to to the Torah, obviously. And Aristotle is like the, the mode of which uh, reason was used at the time. So therefore, in some places he agreed with Aristotle, in other places, cases he did not. And this is one of those cases. Yeah. He has the most respect for Aristotle of all the philosophers. But you'll also see as you read the commentary uh, in the new translation, which is a very extensive commentary, you'll see a heavy influence of Plato as well. Uh, Plato at that time was thought to have believed that God didn't really create the world from nothing. They thought that Plato believed that God created the world by or giving order and organization to pre-existing matter. That's a doctrine called formatio mundi, the formation of the world. Um, that's probably not what Plato really thought, uh, but it was commonly thought that that's what Plato believed. And Maimonides is explicitly dismissive of that view. He says that's just as bad as eternalism. He did respect Aristotle enormously. He could compare Aristotle with, uh, with, with not only with Plato, but with uh, Neoplatonists and, and Muslim uh, Aristotelians. Like uh, uh, you got to remember that Aristotle and Plato were conflated uh, in the Greek tradition, and they were they were considered much much more compatible than they were, uh, let's say, in the Renaissance. Uh, but the uh, he thinks that Aristotle is the one who's worth arguing with. He doesn't think that Epicurus is worth arguing with because Epicurus doesn't uh, really see a role for the gods in nature. Epicurus believes in the gods, but he doesn't believe in providence. He doesn't believe in judgment. He doesn't believe in creation. Uh, so uh, he's, he says he's going to address the Aristotelian view because he thinks that's the best philosophical view. And in many respects, uh, he follows Aristotle, uh, but on on the matter of creation, he thinks that Aristotle got it wrong. He doesn't think he can prove that. He doesn't think that anybody can prove that. Uh, but but he has good dialectical arguments to make his case that his view is more probable because it leaves you the open future. It leaves the uh, the world is not totally determinate and determined, and it leaves you a God who can exercise grace and free will, not just 
working automatically. So theologically, it's preferable, and naturalistically, cosmologically, it's more probable. So he thinks he's got good reason. Having good reason is not the same as having proof. He's very particular about that. And how does he know that? He says Aristotle taught us the difference. Right? <laughs> he, th he thinks he's got a, a good dialectical argument. And and uh, uh, I don't I don't think that he um, I don't think that he's at all uh, sort of shading his opinion there or concealing anything. Uh, in in trying to make that case, he's very open about it. And you know, the, another thing that I think people uh, make the mistake of saying is that maybe the detractors of Rambam they'll say that you know Rambam was a was a dat yachid. He was like a singular kind of thinker, and it wasn't wasn't in line with the tradition. But actually, if you like, you were mentioning before the contradictions in the Torah. The Torah itself, you know, it'll say, let's say, for example. Um, It'll describe the form of God in a way, like his hands, his his finger, and so on. But then in yeah, other places, yeah. yeah. But then in other places, it says that I have no form, right? Yeah. So the Torah does, you know, apply this idea of uh, apophatic uh, negation, right? Yeah. That's right. Apophatic uh, negative theology is very important to the Rambam, and negative theology does not mean that you uh, peel the onion and find nothing inside. It means it means you're moving ever more in the direction of transcendence, uh, and that's that's the move that M Rambam wants to make, and it's it's very very clear. Uh, he he uh, he's very committed to the Torah, but he thinks that if you're going to read the Torah not in the way that a child might be taught, but if you're going to read it in a, in a thoughtful and sophisticated and informed way, you're going to have to understand that the Torah is full of poetry. And at the very first page of the guide, uh, he explains that one of the reasons that he's writing it to this particular disciple who had to move to Aleppo uh, is Yes, I saw what you could do in logic, and I saw what you could do in astronomy and mathematics, and these are all subjects that Rambam was very committed to. But when I saw your poetry, when I saw your makabat, which is a genre of Arabic literature that is uh, a hybrid of poetry and prose, uh, when I saw your makabat, uh, I, I knew that I had to begin to uh, work with you on what the poesy of the Torah is, uh, because, because if we're going to talk about God, we're not going to be able to talk about God in any direct and literal and explicit way. We're going to have to use metaphors. We're going to have to use poetic expressions that, that bring people along, but, but don't, aren't intended to be taken literally. And uh, for example, uh, there's a literature that some mystics get quite crazy about called the Shior Koma. I'm sure you're familiar with it, uh, where they start describing uh, God and uh, how how big he is and how great he is. And, and the descriptions start sounding if, if uh, your listeners have come across uh, the stories of Paul Bunyan. It starts sounding like Paul Bunyan's uh, great blue ox. And babe, the great blue ox, that where uh, a bird would take years to fly from the tip of one horn to the tip of the other horn, uh, they start getting excessive like that. They think that they're glorifying God, and Maimonides uh, finds that kind of approach disgusting. He says he says uh, it, it's it's dreadful that they they thought that they uh, were 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 getting at God. Uh, if you want to get closer to God then you have to understand how utterly transcendent God is, and you have to have a means of working towards the highest, uh, most perfect reality that there could possibly be. And I'll tell your listeners, and one of the things that they'll see in the guide, he introduces the story of Jacob's vision when Jacob sees the ladder and the angels going up and down the ladder. And Rambam conflates that vision with Plato's ladder of love in the symposium, where you're starting out with the physical and moving from the earth on up to the heavens. 
And he conflates it also with Plato's divided line, the Republic. For those of you who, who have read Plato's Republic know that you start out with sensation and you move on to uh, uh, sensory images and you move on from that to mathematical ideas and finally to pure concepts and beyond pure concepts way up above the line just as God is above the ladder in, in Jacob's vision. Uh, way up above what we normally would call reality is where God lives. And uh, that relates to, you mentioned negative theology, apophatic theology. It does demand to saying that God is beyond being, which is something that some Platonists like to say. He thinks that God is beyond being in any usual sense of the term. Why? Because God is a necessary being, and all the beings that we confront in our world are contingent. They might or might not exist. They don't have to exist. They only exist because God gave them existence. But God is above that ordinary sense of being. So although we still call God a being, he's the highest, he's the necessary being, but a necessary being is a, a, a totally separate category from the contingent beings that are the finite realities that we constantly deal with. Yeah, and, and last thing I wanted to say about uh, you mentioned Shira Koma. Also, Sadia Gaon was uh, very much against it, and it was a kind of a proto Kabbalistic work for those who are listening. It um, was, and um, the fact that um, they were so strongly against it uh, should tell you a lot about you know the Kabbalah that came after, which is the Zohar and so on. Um, and the the one thing uh, I, I, I can I can add to that uh, yeah. that uh, Sadia Gaon, as a very young man was interested in the Sefer Yetzira, which is another proto-Kabbalistic work because it's going to make reality out of letters and numbers and so forth. Um, and he, he he tried to encounter that and he found he couldn't make sense of it. And so he dropped it. Uh, and that's a that's an important moment of transition in Sadia Gaon's spiritual and philosophical growth. Question for you: Do you see a correlation between um, Sefer Yetzirah and the Pythagore Pyth Pythagorean school? Of course. Yeah, so I thought not not literally Pythagorean, but Neo Pythagorean. Where yeah, and that's where uh, that's where gematria comes from. All the letters have numerical values, and all the numbers have uh, spiritual and ontological significance. And uh, uh, that's a uh, that's a way of trying to bring. Neoplatonism down to earth. And before we move on to the next question, um, I wanted to also say that you mentioned how uh, the Rambam is insistent that one must read the Torah um, not in a literal way in order yes. to get a to get benefit. That doesn't, that doesn't include the mitzvot, by the way. The mitzvot, you, you know, you read the, the, the read the mitzvot in a rabbinic way. Yes, 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 yes. So actually, that's what I wanted to say. It's worth noting that he did not just apply that in terms of reading the Torah. He also applied it in how to read rabbinics in terms of Agadah. He saw yes. the Agadah in the same way. If you're going to take um, rabbinic exegesis um, in a literal way, you're 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 destroying the whole point. That's right. And, and uh, by the way, he happens to be a past master of doing that. So if you think of the Mishneh Torah as an exegesis of the Halakha, then you've got to think that Agadah is the vehicle of Jewish philosophy. And what it does is it uses indirection, it uses poetic expressions uh, rabbinically. They follow in the spirit of the biblical poetry. And uh, so if if the, the Torah represents God as a king, so they talk about God as a king, who has servants and, and go about doing his business and so forth. Where, where's the first place where the Torah talks about God as a king? When it says Bereshit Bara Elohim et Hashemayim et Haaretz, because how does how does a king make things happen? He commands, let it be so, right? Fiat lux, here he are. Uh, so, so there's an implicit metaphor there that God is being represented as a king. Now we know that literally God is not a king, but it gives you an idea 
of, uh, of how one could think about God uh, by that implicit metaphor. And that kind of poetic language is used throughout the Torah. And as you say, it's, it's picked up on by the Rambam, and he uses it too. And uh, uh, he's, uh, he's very good at it because he does have a good poetic sense himself. You know, another thing before we get to the next segment, um, I just wanted to point out that I started off saying this before that people who are detractors of the Rambam will say, well, he was an original thinker and this is not in line with tradition. But if you look at all of Chazal, they all basically unanimously selected Unculus as the Targum of the Torah, which is he was the anthropomorphizing the entire uh, Torah. And that, that was right. the one they chose. So obviously everybody kind of saw the same thing, anti-corporealist, you know, yes. kind of, so, so he's very much in line with tradition. That's right. And and uh, 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 he has great respect for Targum Onkelos, and he also puts alongside it uh, uh, Ben Uziel. Uh, it, it, that's also the anthropomorphizing, uh, not as systematically as Onkelos, but uh, but he likes that. And he says at one point, you know, if you if you can't uh, if you can't follow the argument I'm laying out here, just Stick with Oculus. He'll he'll keep you on the right track. Uh, so that's that's very much no. Uh, and the other thing, uh, just complementary to what you said about uh, uh, how very much in the tradition Rambam is, uh, he there's all this question about the Mishnah Torah because he doesn't cite its sources. But every time somebody goes to try and find his sources, they find two things. One is that he always has a source. And the other is that uh, he's usually better at interpreting the original biblical text and the source than the ordinary exegete. He's very, very good at exegesis and, and uh, leaves, them, leaves them somewhat in the dust. But, but my motto for the way he uses those texts, the rabbinic texts in the Mishnah Torah, is he never goes naked. He's always got a text. He's always got a text, and you'll see that you'll see that in the uh, in the guide as well. Uh, and uh, he reads those texts very creatively, uh, but he doesn't. There are there are a few places where he disagrees with them too. He disagrees, uh, for example, with the rabbinic idea of the. Uh, Yisrael Ahaba, the sufferings of love, because he thinks it's unbiblical and unjust. It makes God unjust, and therefore it must be untrue. And so he rejects that idea, which Sadia had accepted. Sadia had accepted it because it's a rabbinic idea. And it's a kind of apologetic idea because the idea is, uh, oh, you know, the, uh, the person who's making linen always breaks the best flax. So God makes us suffer because we're the best. It's part of our chosenness. Uh, you can see what motivated the idea of the sufferings of love, but Rambam rejects it. And that's one of the points where he says, rabbi or no rabbi, they were wrong. Uh, and he's not, he's not embarrassed to do that. But usually, usually he follows them and he works with them very creatively. Excellent. Um, so this next one is going to be a long-winded question. Um, it is from one of our friends of the podcast, uh, our friend Brian. So he submitted this, and I uh, just want to get a Maimonidean answer. Um, it's basically involving, you know, uni Unio Mystica or Devekut, as it's known, with the unknowable one. How is that achievable? Um, also, to how do we clarify Rambam's view of the active intellect for our audience, uh, before we get to this question, because I think you need to first establish that, because obviously Rambam and Aristotle they use the same language in describing the active intellect, but they meant something else. Um, first, let me start off with his question. Menachem Kellner has said that Maimonides' project was to, was to depopulate the heavens of divine intermediaries in proto-Kabbalist Judaism. However, Maimonides' theological and cosmological system were still dependent upon finite created intermediaries, the heavenly spheres or intellects that orbit around the geocentric earth, which he identified as the biblical angels. In the guide, Maimonides appealed to the mediatorial role of the intellects in bridging the gap between the infinite 
God and the finite earth, which resides under the lowest sphere. It was through the sun, stars, and planets in which their associated spheres that God indirectly delivered providence, revelation, and miracles to humanity, all of which are biblical theological categories. For example, Maimonides said that Moses received the revelation of Torah when his intellectual perception ascended beyond the lowest sphere up into the higher intellects, beyond the planets as it were. The question this system poses is the following. Now that we have Copernicus and the telescope to tell us that the medieval geocentric cosmology is wrong, what is a contemporary Maimonidean to do with the mechanics of the theological categories? It would appear that there are only two options. Reject that providence, revelation, and miracles occur since geocentric systems, um, <clears throat> Maimonides posited, to enable them do not exist, or else retain belief in those categories by positing a separate theological system that Maimonides had Maimonides never conceived of. Of the Maimonidean scholars I've asked this question, I've only gotten two answers. One, had Maimonides known that his cosmology was incorrect, he would have posited another system. While I agree that only defends Maimonides the man and does not answer the theological question, the second answer is the the invalidation of Maimonides' cosmology is the reason why we need quote-unquote Kabbalistic metaphysical worldview, as it provides for providence, revelation, miracles, without needing to resort to pre-Copernican cosmology. Is there a better answer? Sorry for the long-winded question, but... Oh, that's a good question, and I, I have to say by way of preface that Menachem Kellner is one of my oldest philosophical friends. Uh, he and I have been close friends uh, ever since the 1970s. And uh, uh, he's recently retired. Uh, he's a brilliant scholar and a wonderful uh, human being. Uh, we had him on the podcast uh, also. He's a great guy. I, we had him on the podcast also. Well, he's he's very well spoken. Uh, and I know that that it wasn't he directly who raised that question, but uh, but it comes out of uh, his concerns. Very very real. Okay, uh, let's start with the. Let's start with the geocentric system and the angels, if you will. Uh, Rambam was a good astronomer. He was not a great astronomer, but he was up there with the best of them in his day. Uh, he learned from them. He studied astronomy. He knew it well. Uh, there was a problem that the astronomers of his day could not solve, and it was centered on the apparent retrograde motion of the planets. If you watch the planets very closely, which uh, very few of us actually do, who are not professional astronomers, uh, but in those days it was something that you, a learned person was expected to know that. The planets were all, as the fellow said, geocentric. They were like the rest of the heavens orbiting around the earth. The sun was also orbiting around the earth, the moon too. Uh, all the cosmos, earth was in the center. That's why everything's full. Uh, everything was rotating around the earth. And if that was so, why is it the case that sometimes some of the planets appear to go backwards? And this is called the apparent retrograde motion of the planets. I include the word apparent because it's very difficult to figure out why they would go backwards. There were two prominent theories as to how to explain that. One involved epicycles. Now, people can't see me. This is all audio, right? If I gesture, <laughs> if I just gesture, all right, picture, picture, picture a skater, pardon me? They can see you. Oh, they can. Okay. Yes. Picture, picture a uh, a planet orbiting around the Earth, and one reason why you might think it looks like it's going backwards is because it does a loop the loop, just like a skater who's skating in a circle, and does a little circle on the circle. That kind of circle on the circle is called an epicycle, which is just another way of saying a circle on a circle. And when it's doing that motion, it appears to go backwards. So we can explain the apparent retrograde motion of the planets by positing epicycles. 
circles on circles. The other prominent explanation was eccentrics. Let's not say that you know, all the planets are orbiting the Earth and the center of the Earth is the center of the whole cosmic system. Let's say that the point at which they're orbiting is off center someplace else. And that would give you a mathematical model by which you could explain the apparent retrograde motion of the planets. Rambam knows those two systems. And he knows that mathematically they work. He says, if you take the astronomy of Ptolemy, which was all translated into Arabic, in fact, the name that it's given to this day, the Almagest, is the Arabic title of Ptolemy's astronomical system. You can save the phenomena, you can explain the appearances on either of those two assumptions, and the math works fine, so fine, he says, that you can predict when an eclipse will take place, Mark Twain to the contrary notwithstanding, you can predict when a, uh, an eclipse will take place to the minute, when it will start, how long it will last, when it will end. The math works fine. The physics, not so fine. The physics does not work very well because if you put the center of the cosmos not at the center of the Earth, you'd have a lot of trouble explaining why everything is rotating around some imaginary point. On the other hand, if you have epicycles, you'd have a lot of trouble explaining why these uniform motions suddenly become not so uniform. This was a problem that people were working on. Every astronomer in the Rambam's day, Averroes, others were working on this problem. Averroes wrote about it in his commentary on the uh, Aristotelian metaphysics. He said when he was a young man, he thought he could solve the problem. Now he's an old man and he has not solved the problem. He hopes that one day somebody may figure it out. He doesn't know how. The actual explanation we know with the benefit of modern astronomy is that we don't have a geocentric system and the uh, 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 you, you don't need epicycles, you don't need eccentrics. You need to start out with uh, the sun in the center of the, uh, of the solar system and uh, the revolutions are around that. You're gonna need the theory of gravity to explain why the planets and the, and the uh, moon don't all crash to Earth uh, or to or to the Sun. Uh, that it took not just Copernicus and Galileo. It took it took Kepler to describe the orbits of the planets as ellipses, ellipses that are pretty close to circles, but they're not. And it took Newton to explain those ellipses are results of the centrifugal force of explained by the laws of motion that Newton developed and the gravitational force that Newton explained. If you don't have Newton, you don't really know why it all does just crash to the center. They didn't have that system. And what the Rambam says, which is particularly brilliant and very distinctive on the Rambam's part, he said, it's not the problem of the astronomer to tell you what the actual shape of the cosmos is. What the astronomer has to do is give you the mathematical model that would explain, that would save the phenomena. And he's right about that. We would prefer to have that kind of picture that you could actually build a model that would look like it, but you couldn't. It would get you all folded up with the basic assumptions of Aristotelian physics, and he is not prepared to make that kind of conflict. He thinks that the purpose of astronomy is served by what today would be called instrumentalism. That is, we're not, we're not really telling what it's really like. We're giving a mathematical formula that would allow you to save the phenomenon. Brilliant move on the Rambam's part uh, to move in that direction of instrumentalism. Uh, Pierre Duham, uh, historian of cosmology, thought that uh, Rambam was pretty much unique 
in in adopting that creative move. Uh, and it's a if you want to if you want to under, understand it a little better, look at quantum physics today. In quantum physics today, we say that light sort of behaves like uh, particles and sort of behaves like a wave. And uh, we don't know exactly how to reconcile those two accounts. Um, and, um, you know, my physics teacher in high school said, well, it's a wave. Of That's very nice, but it's not really an answer at all. Oh, we're, we use instrumentalism today to say that there's no operational meaning for uh, knowing the position and velocity of an electron at the same time. You can know its velocity, but not its position. You can know its position, but not its velocity. It's all probabilistic and, and so forth. That's a good example of instrumentalism in today's physics, where we don't really know how to reconcile these two different, ultimately Newtonian accounts of the nature of light, whether it's a wave or it's a particle. And in some behavioral situations, it behaves like a wave. In some behavioral in experimental situations, it behaves like a particle. Uh, well, Rambam has an interesting story to tell about angels. And I want to go to that because uh, we know, as the questioner rightly implies, that the geocentric system is not correct. We know that uh, uh, the heavenly bodies are not inhabited by disembodied incorporeal intellects which run them and which govern the earth through, through their, their influence, the influences. Uh, the word influence, by the way, uh, everyone would like to know is actually an astrological term. It means a non-physical impact. And we should come back to that idea. Um, what does the Rambam say about angels? He tends, on the one hand, to follow the ancient pagan astronomers and cosmologists and philosophers who thought that the pagan gods were really located in the, in the spheres and in the stars uh, and in the planets. And we know that because that's why they have the names they have. Mars and Jupiter and Venus all have the names of pagan gods, don't they? Uh, but the, the real idea, the, 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 the commonplace idea about those pagan gods was that when those Greek words got translated into Arabic, the translators politely changed the reference to gods to angels. So they're angels, they're not really gods, but they're subordinate to God. Uh, as we say in the El Adon, right? Uh, God imparted the power to them to be his overseers on the earth below. Right? We sing that in El Adon. I can sing it for you if you like. Uh, uh, the, and the idea of El Adon is to get people to not be afraid of the heavenly bodies, to not think that they're awesome and arbitrary destructive forces. That has to do with the depopulation of the heavens, indeed, the disenchantment of the universe. And naturalism here goes in hand, hand in hand with uh, monotheism because they are subordinate. They have delegated powers, koach natan bahem, lehiot moshli bekerev tebel, that God gave them the powers they have to be his overseers on the earth below. Well, that's all very good. And the Rambam is sympathetic to that approach. However, when the Rambam gets down, down to talking about what an angel really is, he has a couple of very interesting things to say. And picking up on what the rabbis say about it in rabbinic literature, they say, well, there are two kinds of angels. There are angels that are permanent, and there are angels that do their job, or as they put it, sing their song and go their way. They only last for one moment. Those two kinds of angels represent platonic forms. Those are the permanent ones. And natural forces. Those are the temporary ones. God 
governs the world through platonic forms, which impart the ideas, which are the patterns according to which natural objects operate, and natural forces. Like what it says in the Torah about God said to wing, to blow away the locusts, or, or to bring uh, the quails, or whatever, right? Because uh, God operates in and through nature. Uh, and the natural forces are the means by which God governs nature. Uh, he has an interesting example of that in order to uh, show his reader uh, that natural forces are often called angels because uh, the question arises with regard to Judah. Judah was supposed to provide offspring for his, um, uh, for, 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 uh, that, that he had failed to provide, you know, that, that his son had failed to provide. And uh, she gets offspring, Tamar gets offspring from him by pretending to be a prostitute and seducing him on the way. And so the question naturally arises that since the rabbis think that all these um, patriarchs are so, um, uh, saintly, why did he stop and visit a prostitute? She's there sitting there in disguise by the roadside. And the rabbis answer their question. The angel appointed over lust made him do it. The angel appointed over lust. And the Rambam uses that passage to show you that natural forces can be called angels. That angels can refer to natural forces, in this case, uh, a, 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 a lustful impulse, which led Judah to, to sleep with her. Uh, that suggests to you something about his project in his interest in naturalizing angels. Similarly, he says something rather biting about contemporary rabbis, many of whom he did not respect greatly. And he says, some of those people who call themselves the sages of Israel, if you ask them, what forms the fetus in the womb? They will say, oh, an angel enters the womb and forms the fetus there. And yet, he says, these people believe that an angel is a fiery force one-third the size of the entire cosmos. Did that really enter the womb? Is that fire burning inside this woman? They're not thinking things through. The angel, he said, is the natural way in which the uh, fetus develops. These are the forces, these are the patterns that God has ordained by which life is made possible. If you told them that, they'd think you were crazy. They would dismiss that idea as heretical. And yet they're the ones who think that an angel is a fiery force, uh, one third the size of the natural world. What is he saying? That the laws of nature are the angels by which God governs nature. Their forces, their platonic forms, they're the pattern and nature of things. Uh, well, this is, uh, you mentioned Kabbalah. This is a type of idea that Kabbalists uh, tend to vulgarize, but, uh, but the Neoplatonic idea that forms and forces are what's really meant by angels is where the Rambam takes that idea. So if you set aside the geocentric world, you've still got God governing, and governing by way of natural forms and intellectual patterns. That's going to lead me to say something uh, about the contemporary relevance of the Rambam's thinking. And I'm going to press his idea, and I'm going to carry it a little further than he does in his explicit writing. One of the patterns that Rambam is very interested in is that there are four different kinds of causes. He gets this from Aristotle. Not just mechanical causes with one thing bumping into another. 
There are also teleological causes which involve the purpose or the good of things. There are also the uh, the the uh, the benefit the 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 uh, sorry. Every every kind of cause that Aristotle describes, uh, above all the teleological, the purpose or end of things is part of the causation, the idea, the pattern. The idea is a formal cause. The teleological cause is the final cause. The material givenness of a thing is the material cause. Now we know, if you believe in creation, that God created the matter. We know that God put the matter into motion, but we also know that that motion has a direction to it, has a good, has an end that it serves. It's not just the kind of mechanical cause that today's scientists tend to put the emphasis on. That's the one they can understand and that's the one that they can manage. That's where we have control. Today's physics is basically about causes that we can control or judge or measure. And Rambam thinks there are other kinds of causes, he gets this from Aristotle, which are not the ones that we can manage and control. There's a scientist there's a philosopher today um, named Jaeguan Kim who has argued against the possibility of free will and has argued against the possibility of any kind of divine involvement in nature. And basically what he says is that when you're out of mechanical causes or causes that can be measured and calculated and tracked by physics, you're out of causes altogether there'd be no source of such causation. That's a, that's a restatement of the idea that all causes are mechanical causes. And we know nowadays that not all causes in physics are mechanical causes. There's energy as well as physical particles. There's radiation. There's electromagnetic energy. Physics can encompass all those things, but when it does so, it hasn't told you the whole story about causation. You can see that in the case of evolution. If you think about evolution, which is often raised as an anti-religious line of argument, evolution involves not just the change of one species into another. Evolution involves not just natural selection, but through natural selection, it involves the idea of adaptation. Adaptation in ancient physics, in ancient biology, was thought to be uh, just a matter of, um, you know, the elephant can use its nose to pick up straw or leaves, something to eat. Uh, Adaptation was thought to be just a fact, something that's there. Dogs hunt in packs. Cats sing to attract friends. When you have the idea of purpose, that means that there's something more to adaptation than just change of species. Darwin can tell you why there are no species, because one type is better adapted to its environment than another type. And that idea of better, that idea of better fit, that idea of adaptation is a process that's ongoing and can be explained, is a very important idea in modern science, and it can't be explained by physics.
It can't be explained by radiation. It can't be explained by mechanics. It can only be explained by the pursuit of life, the pursuit of survival, and life for a lineage which will stay around only if it has a little bit better capability of surviving than its predecessors. As the Red Queen says to Alice in Through the Looking Glass, you've got to run pretty fast just to stand still. And if you want to get anywhere, you've got to run not just as fast as you can, but even faster. Evolution does that. Evolution is pursuit of the good. And I'll tell you something that your our listeners will be very interested in. When evolution became a prominent theory in the early 20th century, at the time when genetics was just coming into play, many geneticists were opposed to the idea of evolution because it was teleological. It was looking at trying to explain the fit of animals to their environment and the improving fit and the improving fitness of those plants and animals to their echo niches and to their systems. And they thought that's unscientific. Darwin has introduced the idea of teleology, which we thought we were going to get rid of. We were not going to talk about the good of things. But without teleology, adaptation makes no sense. The idea has to be that organs and organ systems and behaviors have a purpose and that those purposes can be attained more successfully or less successfully. There's value built into the very idea of biology. J.B.S. Holliday, who was a prominent evolutionary biologist, pointed out that evolution to a biologist is like a mistress to a man who's married. He can't live without her, but he doesn't want to be seen in public with her. And so biologists tend to avoid talking about teleology, even though they can't do without it, because they have to rely on it to explain evolution. Now, in modern evolutionary theory, we have a synthesis of genetics with teleology. And we've accepted the idea, which is at the heart of Darwinian evolution, that organs and organ systems have purposes. This is something that's well known to Maimonides, who after all gets his medical practice out of the tradition of Galen. And Galen, who lived in the second century, was the physician of Marcus Aurelius, the philosophical emperor. And Galen knew that organs have purposes, that they serve functions. And Rambam knows that that's the case. You can't be a doctor if you don't know that, because if you, somebody has a, a heart problem or a lung problem or a brain problem, that means that this organ is not doing what it's supposed to do. You have to find a way to get it to do what it's supposed to do. All these things have purposes. So when Jay Gon Kim says that only physical causes are acceptable, and he's insisting that there are no other kind of causes He's intentionally ruling out any kind of cause that would be oriented towards value. He's giving you no causes that would be productive of beauty or truth or goodness or even biological advantage, which is a kind of goodness. Rambam is very sensitive to that. So when he thinks about an angel, that's a metaphorical way, a poetic way of describing what happens inside a woman's womb. When he says that an angel forms the fetus in there, that has a naturalistic explanation. But the naturalistic explanation is rooted in the fact that this fetus is going to turn into a human being. It has a goal. It has a direction. It has an end. 
to which it is striving, just as your heart has a function and your brain has a function and your eyes and my tongue as I speak has a function. That's the good of these things. That's where the angels come in properly, not as guiding the spheres, not as steering the planets, but where the angels come in properly is in projecting those possibilities of improvement. Uh, the With that kind of thinking in mind, Rambam can say the Torah doesn't need to show anything about the reality of angels. It takes it for granted because what it's really referring to poetically by these forces that prophets might envision in their imagination as voices or forms of human beings what those really are, are the emanation of divine influence. Influence in the quite proper sense. Now, here's what I want to say about that idea. It's a Neoplatonic idea. Rabbam has applied it to his own sphere, whether it's astronomy or biology or medicine. And one thing that we can learn from Maimonides and that he learned from the Neoplatonic philosophers like Al-Farabi and Avicenna and Plotinus and Porphyry, one of the things he learned from them is that what is communicated by God doesn't come by way of poetic represented servants and messengers and Malach is a messenger of course that's a poetic way of talking about angels but what's really referred to in that regard is the conveying of information the conveying of an idea the conveying of a pattern and a pattern which is oriented towards the good the true the beautiful that is a different kind of causation than the mechanical kind or even the radiation kind. Radiation might be a metaphor for it, as we say that the light of the sun is a symbolic representation of emanation. Emanation is the key Neoplatonic term. And when you read the guide, you'll see that he uses the idea of emanation that he takes from Neoplatonism and applies it to all of the philosophical problems that the guy deals with. How did God create? How does God govern? How does God inspire prophets? Always by way of conveying information. He makes that the model of charity. Most of our viewers will know that the most the highest form of charity the Rambam talks about is to make someone else self-sufficient. He doesn't confine that to the giving of a gift or support. He thinks of that in terms of God making us self-sufficient by delegating to us the power to act and the wisdom to choose rightly if we are so inspired. He delegates that power to us God imparts ideas to the mind of prophets, which they then have to convey further to people who aren't capable of receiving those ideas for themselves. They pass those ideas along in the form of images and poetry that people can relate to more directly because they take concrete symbolic representation of what is an abstract idea. Think about what Neoplatonists say. Plotinus, who is the founder of Neoplatonism, lived in the third century, says, when I teach somebody, I'm imparting an idea, but I don't lose the idea when I impart it. It's not like, it's not like cooking your soup where the heat goes from here and goes to there. You have the idea and I still have the idea. 
inspiration is a form of em emanation. God is not diminished or lessened by imparting the energies, which are intellectual energies, which are teleological goals that, uh, that God gives by way of governing nature. One final thing on that, because the person who raised the question said, well, are we going to do away with all those intermediaries? I'm afraid we'll have to. We don't have the geocentric universe. We don't have the planets being governed by incorporeal uh, intellects and so forth. Maimonides adopts that system and uh, follows it, and it's useful to him. But remember that Rambam's theology is ultimately monistic. There's one God. He's absolutely simple. He doesn't really work through emissaries and missions and servants. That's a poetic way, a rabbinic poetic way of expressing it. God does it more directly. By the time your viewers see this podcast, we'll be celebrating Pesach. And what happens at Pesach, we read in the Haggadah, is that, is that God did this exodus. Yes, you, I see you smiling. You're thinking, yes, he did it himself, not by way of a seraph, not by way of any of these angels and intermediary forces. God did it himself. And that fits very nicely with the Rob Bob's monism about God. God is absolutely simple. God did not embody any complexity. God is the source of all that goodness and all that guidance. Uh, That's really the difference between the Rambam's view and the Kabbalistic view. Um, he's, the, he's... the Kabbalists, the Kabbalists are a, a, a watered down poor man's version of Neoplatonism, but they're relying very much on those intermediaries. So the intermediaries, intermediaries are the Svirot. They agree with the Rambam that God is the Ein Sof and 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 absolute and infinite. But then they've got to have a way of relating that to the world. So they introduce all these Sviro. Uh, that's the, emanation, the em definition that we're going to use emanation in. in uh, say Lou. Yeah, and exactly. But in the Kabbalistic view, emanation occurs in the Godhead already. It's like a it, it, it it's there's a division there, whereas in Maimonides. Yeah. Not yeah, that, it not. all gets swallowed up inside God. My friend David Novak has made that point and uh that's a mixture. Uh, yeah, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a serious issue within Kabbalah. Uh, but, but you see, it isn't really a third entity between God and nature. It's God directly governing, directly inspiring, directly bringing about causation. If there's, if there's anything in between, uh, uh, where was in between when we get the inspiration uh, we understand it. And that brings us back to the active, in active intellect. So I'll say a word about that because that's where you started. Uh, Aristotle deals with the acts, active intellect in two different texts. One of them that most people who read Aristotle know is in De Anima, uh, book three, chapter five, where he talks about the active intellect and compares it to uh, a source of light. The active intellect makes things intelligible in much the way, analogously, to the way light makes things visible. It was potentially visible, but we couldn't see it unless there was light on it. Uh, but in the other text where he deals with it is a more characteristically less familiar Aristotelian text, it's in the Eudemian Ethics. Everybody reads the Nicomachean Ethics, but the text in the Eudemian Ethics is, um, is where Aristotle says there's a question of how a thought process gets started. We, we can't sort of deliberate that we're going to deliberate. We can't sort of reflect that we're going to start reflecting. What are we going to do? Pull ourselves up by the bootstraps? That's not really possible. Uh, there's only one way that this could be done. It's done by God. 
He says that in the Divian Ethics. It's very nice. And you can see the Rambam is thinking along those lines too. Uh, what's the what's the force of that idea? In the Middle Ages, it was hotly debated whether the whether the active intellect was a separate thing, was it God or something that came from God? Those those Neoplatonic philosophers that uh, Rambam followed, Al Farabi and Avicenna, thought the active intellect was the incorporeal intellect of the lowest of the spheres, um, and uh, it was it was the source of inspiration for prophets and so that, forth. That's the Ishim, right? In the Yes, in the Torah. Yeah, high Ishim are high angels. Right. But think about it for a minute. Hotly debated in the Middle Ages whether it was a facet of the mind, trying to understand what Aristotle said. Was it a facet of the mind, the mind made active, and thus actually intelligizing or thinking or understanding or deliberating? Or was it some external thing that sort of injected this, this knowledge and this inspiration, this thought into your head? And you know what was so misguided about that medieval debate? And of course, the medievals had to go at each other over whether it was hypostatic, external, or whether it was internal and just a facet of the mind. And if you go back to Aristotle, who originated the concept, the answer is, both. It's obviously both. The point about the active intellect is it's the divine impinging on your mind and giving you that thought and making it possible for you to be the thinker of that thought. You become the active intellect. It's not just something external, but it's not something you did by your own bootstraps either, because your mind is God's gift. That's in the Shimon Ezra, right? Dot, dot, right? God graciously imparts our understanding to us. That fits with what I said about Pesach, doesn't it? Here's this, this absolute, infinite, completely undifferentiated God, which relates to us by way of our intellect. That's why it says that we are created in the image and likeness of God. And Rambam glossing that line, right at the beginning, the first chapter of the guide, says that the reference of image and likeness, you got to understand that's poetry, right? God doesn't have a face. God doesn't have an image. The image, the, the reference of the, uh, of the, of the phrase, in, in God's image and likeness, the reference is to the same human sechel, to human reason. Sorry, I can't hear you. You said something. Okay, okay. Uh, so, so uh, the answer is it is it internal or external? Is it coming to us from God, or is it something that involves our own human freedom and creativity? The answer to that disjunction is yes. It's both. Of course, of course. That's how God relates to us. That's how God gives us the understanding and the uh, the ability to act, the ability to operate intellectually. So it's exactly parallel to what I said about Pesa. Not by way of a Sarah. Mm. Right? Mm. It's it's by way of nature. It's by way of the laws of nature. It's by what God gives us from his own supernal, transcendent perfection. You which understand. is beyond anything that we would understand by understanding. I, I've been taking notes as you've been saying all this. That's why you see my head going down sometimes because I'm trying to write notes and put this together for myself. I hope I was more coherent. I didn't feel I was as coherent. It was, it was, it was brilliant and it's something that I, I'm going to have to listen to a few times. I wrote some notes to, just to kind of outline certain things you said and I wanted to ask you if I've been understanding it correctly. But even before yes. I do that, even before I do that, so when it comes to prophecy, you would still posit that prophecy does not need any intermediary processes in order to get from God to, to the prophet. 
Actually, the Rambam thinks it needs a lot of intermediary process, processes. That's why I'm okay. asking. <laughs> okay, let's 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 yeah. let's let's because listen. In the, because in the other everything you've said until it's now, not magic. It's it, not magic. All right, no, I'm just saying everything you've said till now has been can be understood without needing the inter, intermediate processes. That's why I brought in prophecy yeah. right now because prophecy, as you just mentioned, the Rambam really relies on it. So how do we understand this? So, and, and, and all if, if he was alive we today. Prophecy, we don't have Judaism. Yeah, yeah no, right. the intermediary to get to that. Right. No, no, I understand. I understand. The prophet, the prophet is, first of all, got to be very well educated. He doesn't believe that God is going to give prophetic inspiration to a frog. Right? And the prophet also has to be morally pure and uh, he indirectly implies that Muhammad can't be a real prophet because he wasn't uh, pure enough in, in his uh, physical appetites uh, he doesn't name the prophet there but that's what he's implying and he's got to have the right kind of mind in order to have the right kind of mind, he has to have the right kind of brain because we're physically embodied beings. And here he follows Halevi. People conventionally like to contrast the Rambam with Halevi. Oh, Halevi is the man of faith and Halevi believes in language and land and so forth. And Rambam is totally intellectual. Rambam is very intellectual, but he does believe that you can't be a prophet if you're depressed. He says that it can't be a prophet. He thinks the reason prophecy ceased was not because God stopped inspiring people, but because when you lose your confidence, you lose the land, you lose the ability to do that kind of poetic rhetoric, that poetic expression that would give people access. A prophet has to be, according to the Rambam, a prophet has to be an intellectual, a philosopher, uh, someone who is capable of uh, thinking these higher thoughts and receiving that inspiration, yes, from the active intellect, but bear in mind what I said about the active intellect, it still applies. The active intellect is, is your intellect made active by the, by, by the contact with God. Uh, and if you don't have the right poetic gift, if you don't have the right kind of brain, if you don't have the right kind of language, if you don't have the right kind of emotional self-confidence, you won't be able to be a prophet. And Maimonides compares that to a kind of um, uh, uh, miracle that, that, that God can, can by his own free will, uh, uh, you, you might have all the prerequisites, but you still can't do it because because either your brain isn't right or your mood isn't right or your, your morals isn't right, one thing or another. Um, a prophet for the Rambam is a philosopher who has that extra gift of imagination and language and the right kind of brain matter, size and shape. He goes into all that. Uh, and uh, if you've got all the intellectual uh, prerequisites, you still might not have the poetic gift. God might withhold prophecy from you. And he gives examples of people in the guide. He, he names figures who tried. They were, they were disciples of prophets and they couldn't get there. Uh, you know, uh, if you want a comparison to, to make it very accessible, think about, think about somebody who wants to be a concert violinist. And he does all the theory and he learns all the music and he makes all the movements, but... He doesn't have that extra gift, uh, uh, and he not, you know, he might be able to play in an orchestra, but he's not going to have the feeling that that would make him a concert soloist. And that's the kind of thing that the Rambam has in mind with a prophet. He's got to have the right imagination. He's got to have that poetic gift. You can go to school and 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 learn how to write, but if you don't have a poetic gift, you'll never be a writer. Uh, that's that's what he has in mind. Now, now uh, there is 
you could metaphorically speak of that as being imparted by this angel-like thing, which is called the active intellect. But the intellect, the active intellect is just another way of saying that you've got the inspiration. So the mediation, the 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 the, the ontology of it, there's not another thing there that that is that is mediating between you and God. So if he's alive, if he was alive today, um, he would have no issue saying that there's no, you know, we don't need these stages in between. The, the, the inspiration could still since be since ultimately, since ultimately the root of the of, of Maimonides, the, the, the Maimonides direction is always going to be towards God's transcendence. If we have an ability to create a a middleman processes that doesn't impinge on his transcendence, okay, great. But if we don't have that, as proven by the geocentric model, you know, not working, the Ramam will just fall right back onto where it really all starts, which is which is in the monotheistic conception of God's transcendence. It's going to be direct. It's yeah. going to be that's direct. All it is. That's all it is. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, all, all of that other stuff, uh, and that's, you know, he could talk about the angel appointed over lust, but he doesn't really literally believe that there's an angel appointed over lust. You know, the point is the point is that 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 Judah was subject to that as anybody might have been, and and uh, this is what he did, and and uh, it, it it was you you could say it was nature intervening, and so uh, nature gets personified. So you're you're not doing much better than saying an angel appointed over lust, right? Uh, uh, it's he likes to. The person who said he wants to depopulate the heavens is right. Uh, and that is a basically monotheistic move. The disenchantment, which makes physics possible, is a monotheistic move. And, and the uh, we don't have arbitrary spirits going around uh, doing this and that. Uh, it's, it's basically between you and God, and and um, the rest the rest is poetry, and it's useful poetry because it can enable people to connect and 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 try and envision these things. But you know what what's symbolized by Jacob's ladder is what matters, which is that there's a that there's a uh, a connection from the ladder which stands on the earth to God, who is at the highest degree. Degree means steps. Uh, the steps, what are the steps? They're the steps that a human being must go through to accommodate, to, 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 to arise to that, to that level. Uh, just, like, just like in Plato's symposium with the ladder of love. You, you, these are these are steps that we have to achieve. Um, as far as uh, what prophecy would be today, he thinks that prophecy could be restored if we regain our land, uh, because then we would have the confidence. I would add a little bit to that. We have regained our land, but not uncontested exactly as we know today in the horrible things that are going on. Uh, and we haven't necessarily got the moral purity. People who think they're morally pure because they uh, they drive an electric car instead of an internal combustion engine car are not quite as morally pure as what the Rambam had in mind. Uh, he 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 was talking about he was talking about somebody who doesn't talk himself into thinking that he's that that he has attained some kind of moral perfection. Uh, by uh, by being politically correct, uh, we've got a ways to go. But he does not think that it was some kind of supernatural thing. Like once we had prophecy, and once we do, we no longer do. Uh, I would add one thing, however, uh, and this this is not something the Rambam says. I would add that we. In order for somebody to be a prophet, there have to be people who's ready to listen to it. We don't have that. 
somebody's standing on the corner and saying, oh, you're all doomed or something like that. People walk by, they, they smile, they laugh, they make faces, they make gestures. Uh, that idiom is no longer successful as a way of reaching people. Uh, and whether there is an idiom that could reach people uh, in, in a really important and impressive way, uh, that remains to be seen. So it's not just a matter of, uh, you know, we don't have the confidence to speak like prophets. We don't have the confidence to listen to prophets. Uh, it, so if you're talking about somebody trying to do that today, uh, that's a serious issue. This was incredible. I want, with your permission, to kind of just give you an outline in some of my notes and just if you can just let me know if I'm on the right track with everything. Sure. I think that I've started to um you know get this but let's let's just go through it your basic idea is is that these intermediate in, intermediate processes are not necessary to achieve the result that Maimonides would want to achieve that's so, right that's right now with angels Right. You made a very, very important point that and I and it's it's interesting because a lot of times I remember that when people, you know, when you say like angels are forces of nature, it sounds like it's a almost like a like a cheap way of getting around the idea of angels. What you said was subtle in that you're saying that, no, it's not just angels are forces of nature. It's just a, a word used or whatever you're saying that when we use angels to portray forces of nature, we're trying to elevate nature. We're elevating nature more from just being natural into something that is filled with meaning. I think you're right. Uh, that's that's beautifully put, Betsy, uh, because if you think about it, um, when, I, when I was speaking uh, uh, more roughly than I should have about different kinds of causes, uh, what I wanted to get at was that beyond radiation, beyond physical mechanism, there's uh, there's causes that are elevating. It's presupposed in evolutionary biology, but they're kind of embarrassed and shy about it, like J.B.S. Haldane said. Uh, but these are causes that involve, yes, elevating uh, the mind, to a higher plane, as as someone might have in poetic inspiration or or artistic inspiration, and artistic inspiration that would really create beauty and not just uh, novelty, uh, and and um, it would involve uh, uh, the functioning of our organs and our bodies, the functioning of our mind, the evolution of species, so that they can become more adaptive because they're in a challenging environment that if they don't adapt, they're going to die out. Uh, that kind of causation is the kind that physics doesn't deal with. Biology and medicine have to deal with it. Uh, psychology has tended to stay away from it, but but Maimonidean psychology is very aware of it. Uh, so, so you can think of... Uh, the growth of the mind uh, uh, rising to a higher plane. Uh, yes, I think I think you're absolutely right. And when it comes to the active intellect, yes, which is in a sense even bigger because it, it plays into so many more uh, fundamental uh, aspects. Um, yes. So if I understood you correctly. What you're trying to say is, is that even when you when you go look into Aristotle and even when you start to pick apart the active intellect, at the end of the day, it's not that your mind is going into an active intellect. We're talking always about our own mind. It's talking about the animation and inspiration that our mind uh, can 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 all of a sudden have a spark with. And so what it would be nice with the concept of active intellect, it, it gives it, it you know, for, if we can, if the Rambam, who, who at that time, that was 
reason for him to not believe so, right? If the Rambam wants to use active intellect as the intermediary in, ter in terms of what inspires our mind, great. But if the active intellect doesn't work because we're throwing out the geocentric model, that does not mean that the same effect can't be caused by God outright. That's right. Uh, you, you take a word like, there's some words that have been cheapened by uh, overuse. Sublime is one. Sublime meant originally, you know, in the 18th century, it meant uh, a, a sign or a sight or experience that was overwhelming because you felt like you were in touch with something divine. And then it became, you know, popular pablum of tourists, you know, uh, Niagara Falls is sublime and the people lost the use of that word and they just would stand there and say, ooh, ah, you know, uh, well, the same sort of thing happened with inspiration. Inspiration uh, means that you're getting an idea or trope of poetic expression, a musical inspiration. You're saying that that came from God. We don't think it has to come from a muse. We think if it's real and we appreciate God, it's coming from God. That doesn't mean that it's coming to everybody the same. It's coming to me. I'm going to try and communicate it. I'm going to try and explain it. I'm going to try and share it. And if I'm a poet, I'll, I'll use imagery to try and share it, to make it more accessible to people who haven't shared the same experience. Uh, there's, a, there's a term uh, right at the beginning of the guide, even before chapter one, uh, uh, he talks about uh, lightning flashing. And it's an image that's used by Avicenna and other uh, Neoplatonic philosophers. And sometimes he says, the light flashes so frequently that it seems to be continuous. Why? Why is it not continuous? Well, because we're human beings. We live in a temp temporal world. We, we don't uh, live in that timeless world that we think of as a divine world. Uh, but it looks continuous to us because it's so repeated and so steady. Uh, and some people, he says, don't see that light at all. But maybe they see it reflected by some shiny object. That shiny object, as I explained in the commentary, that shiny object is the prophet. He gets it directly, and he finds a way of sharing it with others who don't get it directly. So they get it indirectly. And that's that's what prophecy does. That's what revelatory books do for us. Uh, they put us in touch with, with, a, uh, with a source of inspiration. In the case of Moshe Rabbeinu, that inspiration gives you a, a system of law and a way of life. In the case of some other prophet, it gives you a vision. It gives you a... Uh, a, a, a momentary epiphany, which he tries to share in in uh, poetic language, uh, mediated by imagination. In the case of Moses, it's it's uh, uh, only only his intellect, the uh, pellucid lens of of the human mind, is the only thing between him and God. Uh, but but in the case of um, in the case of another prophet. It, it comes colored, it comes uh, uh, by way of uh, the, uh, the colored lenses of uh, prophetic imagination, uh, which, which give him the poetic uh, tropes that he needs to uh, express, to try and convey to others what he has uh, understood by way of his imagination. And you know, yes. When, and then when you say this, it, it actually makes to me what I just just kind of popped into my mind is it's highly unlikely to me to think that the Rambam would hedge his bet on his entire understanding of Judaism by a necessary understanding of certain intermediate concepts. It's very, very difficult because A, 
the Rambams always stress transcendence and monotheism in everything. It makes sense to me that if he's going to create some geocentric model or or however, even as Benji noted, it has to be post-creation A, so that's not even going to ever impinge on God's unity. But B, it also doesn't make it necessary doesn't make it necessary that that is necessary. Because ultimately, when we have this model of transcendence, we we don't we're not forced to have to explain these things in terms of how it gets from point A, God, to B. Because, no. because we're, not, we're not working with he's things got, in any he's got a couple yeah. Yeah, he's got a couple of things going on there. On the one hand, he wants to uh, operate in terms of science as known in his day. And a science in his day, he knows it doesn't quite work, but he's going to work with it the best he can. Yeah. So he's not going to be off by himself, uh, just as he respects uh, the, the halachic and uh, midrashic tradition and use it as best he can. He's also going to respect the scientific tradition. And uh, that's the science that comes to him. He's aware of scientific progress. I don't think he was aware of how radical the process would have to be before, uh, be, 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 you know, uh, the, the, heavens would, the heavens would have to be turned inside out in order to uh, explain a simple fact like the retrograde mash, motion of the planets. Uh, but he, he, he wants to use that kind of science. He wants to, he wants to show you that modern science is compatible with Torah. And he, he says a couple times that science is makes progress he does not believe uh that uh you know the decline of the generations uh he thinks that he thinks that there's progress in halakha he thinks that there's progress in science as well and uh uh like ibn rushd he's waiting i'm always he's, he's waiting uh to see how it all turned out and he didn't live long enough the the, the centuries that it would take to turn out better and we have to, uh, in similar humility, recognize that um, uh, the science that we have is itself a work in progress. Uh, it's, it's, it's not bad. It's not inferior uh, uh, to religion. It, it goes hand in hand with religion. Uh, he, one, one thing he says about science, um, uh, he says this with regard to the uh, the, the mythical music of the spheres. It was thought by Neo-Pythagoreans that, this, that the, the spheres uh, move so harmoniously uh, that they must make music. And uh, uh, Ptolemy was entranced by that idea because he liked the Pythagorean angle on it, the mathematics of it, because music is very mathematical. Uh, and the Rambam picks it up from Aristotle that uh, if the if the spheres made music, we would have heard it, and uh, we don't hear it, so uh, he doesn't think that it's true. And then he says at the end of that chapter uh, that we we have to follow, uh, and he, he picks this up from from Chazal from the from the rabbinic sages. He says um, we have to follow the sages of the nations. Uh, in in all these scientific questions. Uh, that's a very, very telling remark. But what it tells us in terms of the point that you're making is he's using the best science that he knows. He knows that that science is not going to be forever. There will be progress. There will be new, further things learned. Uh, and our commitment is to this best science that he knows. So, for example... When it says in the Torah that uh, Joshua is fighting a battle, and uh, uh, it seems to say that the sun stood still. Uh, and the Catholic Church got into great exercise about that. And they, people had to believe that, that God made the sun stand still uh, in order for the battle to be finished completely, properly. Uh, Rambam says, no, what it says, if you read the, the Hebrew, it says that it seemed the longest day of the year. It seemed like 
like a full day. He means subjectively the way it felt when they were fighting. It seemed like the sun was not setting. It was subjective. God didn't make the the the, the whole cosmos cease its motions just to allow the battle to be completed properly. We follow the teachings of the sages of the nations. Astronomers, they don't have to be Jewish, right? So uh, uh, that's that's his vision. And, and it directly addresses the point that you were raising about uh, uh, if Rambam were alive today, he would rely on the best science that we have. But that best science has to be sharply distinguished from scientism. The idea that mechanical causes are the only causes is a false idea. The idea that the causes that are known to physics because they're the ones that we can control is a bad idea. We know about teleological causes from biology. We know about beauty. We know that beauty and truth are real. And if you want to picture the active intellect as the source of that kind of causation, that's a poetic way of expressing the fact that God is ultimately the source of that kind of causation, that God gives us beauty and truth and value. Amazing. Right? This was incredible. This was incredible. First of all, the question I, I almost felt bad asking because it was so long, but um, your answer was so thorough that I feel like, you know, we're going to have to go back and listen to it over oh, yeah. and over again because there was a lot there and it, you were really building it up and, and building on, you know, each point and, and really like creating a tapestry. So I think that, you know, for us who are listening to this over again, um, we should really appreciate what you just did. because it's, it's, it's very, very obvious that you care about the question very, very much. I, I do. Uh, I have thought about this question both in connection with Rob Baum and in connection with my own philosophical work. Uh, I have a, a new book that's um, in the oven right now. It's, it's uh, going to be published by Cambridge University Press on God and Truth. And uh, uh, obviously, I'm inspired by the Rob Baum, uh, but I'm also carrying these ideas further in terms of what we know about cosmology and evolution. I'll give you a little kicker on this. The big problem in Maimonides' time was that they thought that creation was illogical, impossible, and so forth. And he showed that it wasn't impossible. But he would have given his eye teeth to know what we know about the redshift. Because the redshift tells us, when I was, when I was a kid in college, even in graduate school, there were two main theses about cosmology, Fred Hoyle's steady state theory and the alpha and beta and gamma theory about the Big Bang. And now we have sufficient evidence to say that steady state physics is no longer the right story, that there really was a Big Bang. If Mombam had known that there was good evidence to say that the universe began, not proof, it's good evidence, but there's good evidence that the universe began. He did not think that we could have any evidence that he didn't realize that astronomy, because we know about the redshift, would tell us that there actually was an initial singularity, which could be interpreted as the moment of creation, you know, 15 billion years ago. That's he would have he would have given anything to know that. Uh, it's it's very rich. It's very powerful. By the way, even Fred Hoyle couldn't do without continuous creation. His matter had to be continually created in, in order to keep a universe steady state. But we but we now know that the Hoyle's theory was was a good theory, but was not a correct theory. And what seems to be the correct theory is that the universe did begin. Uh, Rambam would have been thrilled and delighted to know that. And when you think about the fact that people use evolution against theism, when evolution gives you a teleological concept which supports theism, uh, that shows you the kind of rhetorical bind we're in. Uh, and the physics, which does support creation, 
Um, oh, that's kind of neglected in those discussions. Thank you so much. And before we go, um, we want to want you to plug your your book, your translation uh, one more time. Um, let us know how we can get it um, and so on. And also, you know, I one thing I wanted to say that for all our Sephardi listeners, uh, you'll find you'll be very happy to see some great citations in there from Chacham uh, Jose Faur. And you'll see Menachem Kellner and so on. So there, there are some really good uh, resources that you uh, that you were influenced by, which is really amazing to see. Ben, Ben, uh, uh, one of the reasons why a new translation was needed and a new commentary, quite beyond the question of uh, Leo Strauss and his 1935 uh, thinking about it. There's been a vast amount of literature about the Rambam. Uh, and uh, we try to reflect that. Phil Lieberman and I try to reflect that in the commentary. And it's uh, again reflected in the Guide to the God. They're both published by Stanford University Press. They'll be out in May. Uh, and uh, uh, I look forward to hearing uh, from people who uh, get a hold of the book and, and read it. Uh, it uh, they will learn from the Rambam, as I did, working on that book for decades. Every day I worked on the guide, I learned something new. Every day, over a period of decades, it's that rich. You can learn from it every single day. Unbelievable. That we're so excited uh, for that. And also, we're going to obviously promote uh, the hell out of that book when it comes out. Mm -hmm. So we're very excited. We are uh, excited for the book and we're excited for you. And we are, we hope that this is not our final podcast together. Um, there is more to unearth. There's more to talk about. Like you said, with Maimonides, there's, there's always, always, always a conversation to be had. And uh, we wish you good health and we wish you uh, to enjoy the achievements of, of decades of work that you put into this book. And thank you so much for giving us the time to elaborate on the book and on that major question that we brought up, um, we couldn't have been more pleased and more appreciative. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you both very much. And it's been a real pleasure. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing the podcast when it's posted. Let me know uh, and uh, I'll tell my friends. And we will be in touch. All right. Take care. Be well. Thank you.